Fill to Capacity, Crazy Good Stories and Timely Topics, Podcast for people too stubborn to quit and too creative not to make a difference, inspiring, irreverent, and informative. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Pat Benincasa, and welcome back to Fill to Capacity. Today's episode is The Wind Spinner's Tale, Rod Reed's Energy Revolution. My guest is Rod Reed, CEO of Windswept Kite Turbines, a company pioneering the use of kite turbines for wind energy. He's an engineer and inventor. He's been fascinated by wind power for years, and he's the brains behind kite turbines, aiming to make wind energy more accessible and efficient. Now, while traditional wind turbines are static and limited by height, Rod's kites can reach higher altitudes where winds are stronger and more consistent. So besides being an entrepreneur, he is also an advocate for renewable energy, speaking at various conferences and contributes to research in the field. Okay, in a nutshell, Rod Reed is a guy who looked at the sky and saw a powerhouse, then rolled up his sleeves to make it happen. Okay, welcome, Rod. So nice to have you here. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. It's lovely to be talked about like that. <laughs> it's great. I think, you know, I didn't even have to look at the sky. The, the cheesy line that I like to come up with is I was born in a storm. You know? <laughs> oh, that's really I was, good. Yeah, I, I, was, I was brought up in a very windy place. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would make that was, sense. That was really nice. Thank you so much for the intro. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, before we begin, I just would like to tell our listeners that windswept kite turbines is based in the Shetland Islands off the northeast coast of Scotland. Right. Now, it looks like you're on, on the main island, and from what I researched, it's a relatively remote area. Okay, Rod, how did you locate on the Shetland Islands? Wow, well, I'm going to take you back to another island, first of all, because uh, I was brought up on the Isle of Lewis on the west coast of Scotland, and it's another very windswept um, uh, open rural place and so yeah i was brought up with the sailing and the windsurfing and the, the the kite surfing and the rest there but um in 2020 there, there was a little medical thing going on in the world you know, it was quite popular at the time there was something called a pandemic and uh, my, my wife just happens to be a medical director and uh, got the, the job up here so we actually relocated to shetland it's not so hugely uh, different to the isle of lewis it it doesn't have all my old pal base and such. It's, it's It's got an airport that was closed down, so that's a good place to test uh, kites. It's yeah. got, um, yeah, plenty of wind resource. And so it's, it's also got really good engineering history up here. They've got this uh, oil terminal. They've got an amazing fishing fleet. They've got you know, just really good infrastructure all around from investment. And there's now one of the largest, uh, one of the most profitable uh, wind farms in the world this year. So, yeah, it was a good place to come to. I guess. Well, I'm really curious, what sparked the idea for kite turbines and how do they differ from the traditional wind turbines? I like to put it down to a pal of mine, Chippy. He told me I was really enthusiastic about these wind turbines that were getting built back on the Isle of Lewis. And I was chatting about it outside a pal's bicycle shop and he was saying, no, they're terrible. They, they rip up the moor, they're really heavy, they're, they're made of huge amounts of steel, they cost a fortune, it takes so much energy to make them. And so he had a point and I looked it up and I saw other people making this argument who just happened to be into something to do with kites. So, you know, I looked up what you know, the light, the most lightweight yeah. energy systems. And so, okay, I started looking, I started reading these Yahoo forums that were a bit wild. I started reading this airborne wind energy science. I started getting involved and just getting more and more involved. And then 
Yeah, as I, I was a house husband, effectively, at the time. I, I was looking after two young boys. Um, I had a few, I, Being on an island, I had a whole load of other jobs as well going on. You always end up doing everything. And so I had my engineering background, my sailing and all sorts of sports. And it just it, it came to me that, OK, the, these kites, I could reconfigure them in different ways. And I can do all this. And, but it, it was really hanging out with a pal. Ali G one night and uh, I just thought oh my goodness that you, you can network them in a way that turns so they're constantly spinning you can stack them that way and you can just make it a, a much bigger system yeah uh, so it's all about the scalability all about making something that is an efficient way of working and scalable um the thing about the kites in order to make them scalable, they have to be sort of small and lightweight and networked and moving fast and sweeping through a lot of air. Now, that's a lot of things to tie together, literally a lot of things to tie together. You have to make quite a lot of small wings and, and tie them together so that they're all working together. Well, now um, you're using the vernacular tying together. So that leads me to the next comment. So you could say that turbines are a bit like flying windmills connected by ropes that turn the generators on the ground and they make yeah. the electricity from the high altitude winds. Is that yeah. okay? My question, <laughs> I really, I spend weeks studying this because I you love it. You did that really well. <laughs> I love engineering things. So this really is my curiosity. So my question to you is what happens if there's no wind or do the kite turbines adapt to different wind levels. Yeah, we both. So yeah, when there's no wind, we'll bring them down. So on on the ones we've got at the top of the turbine, there's another kite that that is the first one that's launched. Just a very standard kite aerial photography kite, but adapted to be a bit more active. So it's it's pulling harder than than a normal kite. That one we can pull up and, and pull down as needed. And that controls the, the whole turbine stack. So our turbines are just purely passive. There's no active controller in them. It's just they sit there mechanically autonomously in the wind, spinning away. And we can control in the wind where they're sitting so that they're either you know more efficient or not. You can run the, the generator backwards uh, so that you turn it more into like a fan and, and than a turbine. So it'll actually support itself with a bit of lift. But not indefinitely. It's not very stable like that. And you'd need to be pumping the kite at the top as well to be able to maintain that properly. So, you know, we have to pull it out of the air um, eventually, you know, when the winds get below about, you know, three and a half metres a second, something like that. Okay. So it's quite so low, yeah. On your, your website, you use a terminology, multi-line torque transmission system which I think means multiple ropes to transfer the spinning motion of the kite yeah. to the generator on the ground. Is that correct? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is the most fundamentally odd part of the, the whole idea. And this is the part that it, it, no one transmits torque. Like we, it was weird. We haven't needed a solution like this before. And so I had to think, okay, right, I want to get something spinning around and I want that to send power down to ground. I want it to be rotary. Yeah. Okay. If I just have strings close together, they're going to over twist. They're, they're going to knot together and, and like break. So how do you keep these lines apart? How do they not tangle? Yeah, there's there's three main things. The lines are really tight. They, you know, they inherently want to stay straight. We also keep them apart with these rings that go between the lines. So we have polygons of, of rigid uh, like carbon rods between them to hold them apart mm -hmm. with those two things alone that's fine you can send torque that way over a system but we also fly the kites outward a wee bit from the rotational plane that, that they're on in the rotor so the kites are flying out and that's holding the, the lines out as well so across the stacks you can transmit even more torque down that stack so wow and each layer of rotor you put on each layer of kite builds more tension into the system. So you can then more efficiently transfer torque down that stack. And it's, a, it's been a, a big, steep learning curve how to make a system like that. But uh, <laughs> we're getting there. 
It sounds like geometry in motion. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real kinetic structure, you know. And the, the weird thing is, it's the wind that builds it. It's the... <laughs> yeah, that's what's so beautiful about it. Yeah, yeah. So in a BBC piece about you, the kite engineer striving to revolutionize do-it-yourself wind power said, quote, Rod has successfully charged an electric vehicle with his kites. Can you tell us about <laughs> that? The very first one was actually even just an electric bike. That was the first ground station of one of these kite turbines that ever made electricity was an electric bike upside down in a field. So that's the first vehicle. So yeah, I used to have to stop the test, take the bike, and then like cycle the power off. <laughs> that was great fun. <laughs> So I had to move anyway up, up, you know, up a scale. We've been scaling and scaling, and uh, you know, we're now trying to develop ten kilowatt system at the moment. But the one and a half kilowatt system, I used to charge up the batteries of that, and it would take you know a lot of efforts to. You know, I've done part charges of the car. I haven't yet gone on a a full mission, uh, like drive up the hill, recharge the car fully, and go anywhere. That is still yet to happen. In Shetland, I haven't done a lot of flying here. I'm it's mostly development, mostly systems work that I've been working on here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more testing still to be done. But the, when we get more systems out and more more testing done, we've certainly done trials where we've gone to Norway, we've gone to Austria, we've all about just uh, testing in different, because they are very portable, these turbines. You can, you can pack them right down and, and take them with you. And, you, know, you can put them in the van like this. Yeah, I've still got to do that. I I've, I've really must get around to doing a cool mission. A, like little, that more, a little more testing. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always. It sounds like the kite turbines would be location specific. So some areas don't generate a lot of wind. Maybe they're not near an ocean or they're not on the prairie. They don't generate a lot of wind. So... Do you have to be site specific as to where you locate the kite turbines? Yeah, th th there's various ways you can deploy a kite turbine. So I'm looking at a few different systems at the moment, actually, other than just the, the ones you've seen on the website. There's ways you can suspend these across valleys. There's ways you can go offshore and launch and you know, use drone handling to make large arrays and, and, and spread them offshore. Um, that yeah, there are places where wind just isn't you know isn't a great resource, and and you're if if you're looking for renewable energy, you, you'll be better off doing nuclear, solar, uh, geothermal, tidal, wave, you know, any of the other methods that you can can work on. But I guess any technology is going to have places where it's more yeah. applicable or not. Yeah, there are certainly small versions of the system that, that I've been working on and I've open sourced uh, designs. Uh, and, and, you know, so hopefully people with, you know, very little resource can make their own systems and nice. yeah, build them for themselves. So, yeah, we'll hopefully we'll discover more and more places where people will be able to test. Yeah, well, I saw on your website, or, you encourage people to build and test these small scale turbines. Now, how would the everyday person, they're not trained as an engineer, but let's say somebody who, who's interested in this, could they do this? What kind of technical knowledge do they need? Yeah, good question. Uh, I suppose it took me a fair bit of sewing, a fair bit of gluing, cutting wings, um, <laughs> playing with kites a lot, you know, playing with, there's some mechanisms right now. Bicycle, a bike maintenance, bit, a bit of skill in that, that would be good. Other than that, you, do, you don't need a lot more than that. Maybe model making, or some airplane model making. Available to the hobbyist. This is you know, a bit of electronics. This sounds like something I would see in art school because artists had to do exactly what you're describing, trying different materials, different things to see how to make something work. Basically, giving form to a good idea. That's what that sounds like. They, you just have to be creative and open to the possibility yeah. of putting it together. Oh, make so many mistakes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I have so many horrific, ugly models that I just, uh, in the loft that are hidden away, it's like, oh, did I really try fly that? <laughs> but yeah, they're finessing ever more so now. And they're becoming, you know, really quite intricate. To, uh, yeah, the power to weight ratios in them are incredible at the moment. Um, you know, what's really fascinating to me is when you talk, you sound like someone who's not afraid of mistakes. 
it's like you welcome them because you get you more learn. information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You can't have a favorite idea either. And and we recently have broken part of the design, like saying, no, no, there's a better way to go about this. And, and that's, you know, created all sort of upset and rupture in the business and stuff. It's like, right, no, change focus. We're off this way now. And so it's, yeah. You've got to be pretty brutal and honest with yourself about how things are if you're going to get it right, you know. I suppose, and the main feature of that is uh, your fluidity, that you have to be fluid, that you can't say, I'm going to do it this way. By God, it's going to be this way, because when you try it, it doesn't work. It, it humbles yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the wind wind will humble you for sure. It's, uh, yeah, it's brutal stuff. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I've never quite thought of the wind as being brutal per se, unless it's a storm. But I like the way you phrase that in terms of your own <laughs> research. <laughs> I was curious in the United States as of 2023, there are about 90,000 wind turbines. I'm talking about the giant wind turbines on the stem with the huge propellers. And so with those giant wind turbines, there's been a whole host of safety concerns. Part of it is that birds flying into them, the cost of making them, the stability of them, et cetera. Are there safety concerns with the kite turbines? Because they're really airborne at a high altitude. Yeah, the highest altitude we're flying to at the moment is only 100 meters, actually. We, we can actually... Because of the the way I construct the the setup, I, I'm able to fly within an air traffic control zone even. But yes, the the idea is it's scalability. We're looking to go much higher in order to get that benefit of going into stronger winds at altitude. But with such a lightweight system, you have much less kinetic energy basically. There's a, a much lighter weight parts, so if anything, it's not going to break away because it's in a network and it sort of feels safe but were anything to break away we've only ever had one piece ever break away and now that's been all sorted yeah <laughs> were, were anything to ever break away your kites need restraint in order to be able to be able to fly or to, to make power yeah. so they just drop otherwise so we have these exclusion zones um that we operate at the moment whilst we're still learning what, what everything is and, and how it all works but th these are very short it doesn't uh, it doesn't take up a lot of land at the moment. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, bird safety is one that yeah everyone asks about. Uh, we haven't seen any incident yet, and certainly in cars, cats, and uh, buildings are are some of the worst things for birds. Uh, so yeah. sort of yeah pylons and and the rest of it. I'm not going to make any excuses. Wind turbines must have an effect too. Yeah. Yeah, we have that's something we definitely have to keep an eye on. But the good thing about a kite turbine is you can bring it down if, if you know there's going to be a migratory path or if there's a, a season that you maybe don't want to have a, a turbine located in that position. Yeah, take it down. Yeah, so that, that the safety, aviation risks, uh, bird risks, yeah, that there are ways to, to mitigate these for, for all the systems. Really. Well, the idea of the kite being so maneuverable, the fact that mm. you can pull it down, you can adjust it, you can take it down, leave it up. It seems to be a strength of it that makes it really it's, usable. Yeah, in terms of testing uh, and getting permission to test, if you look at groups like Kite Mill in Norway, their airport in Lista, so airborne wind energy, uh, it's, it's a small community, we're all pally, so yeah, we all help each other with integration into civil aviation and such so they have to be able to take their kite down in 10 minutes in case a helicopter is going past so they're that's automated as well so yeah we're going to be building in a system very much like that um, and using like next gen communications up on the kites so that they will be able to autonomously come out of the sky as as deemed by the network controllers you know flight network controllers so that's what i was concerned about aviation path and that yeah. you would have to be mindful of that. Now, let me ask you another question. In this last year, especially AI, artificial intelligence expanded exponentially. I mean, it's just been incredible in all fields. Do you see an AI component to the kite turbines that they would know when to come down, when to go up, or to sense some flying object near it so that it would lower. 
Absolutely. The, so the, if you look at the, the data that's available through, I mean, our weather forecasting is, is an AI at the moment. You, you're looking at patterns and repeating them. You know, we have data um, APIs for flight traffic and, and such. So your ADSBs, your, your transponders on your planes and such, you, you need to integrate all that into the, the command and control of when you operate systems like this. And so with all that technology available at the moment, that's that's really going to help in deployment. But one thing I'd, I'd really like to see more of in AI is development of physical modeling. So it's really quite hard sometimes to get experimentation done on systems modeling and some of the fluid dynamics and such, but having stronger and stronger computers able to to play with some of these elements in virtual wind tunnels uh, and you know just uh, experiment with what can crash as a kite and what doesn't and especially when it comes to complex systems like kite networks like i've been designing because we don't have great models we we have physical models at the moment yeah. uh, most of the time yeah yeah we've done simulations we've done you know calculations on uh, all the torque transmission and stuff but yeah, but it's we still have to rely on physical models most of the time in order to get data on performance, and and so yeah, I'd really, I really think there could be a lot of work done in AI on those. Uh, yeah, and when you think about holograms that they do surgery models, they can do a hologram of someone's heart when they're doing heart surgery and look at that as they're doing surgery. I mean, the idea of not having to build the physical model over and over and over again, because that's time consuming. I've built Absolutely. over 500 architectural models in my own creative practice. So when you talk about building a model, it's not like you go into the shop or the studio and crank it out in a day. The model will replicate the large scale piece. Whatever happens to the model happens in real life. Whenever I built a model of a major piece, when we go to install, any problems in the model will show up in the big piece. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, if, if if it's happening at that small scale, it's yeah, it's gonna be very problematic yeah. at the big yeah. scale. Yeah. 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 The um yeah, the three D printing I've been using for for making this. That's another great thing for the putting the fuselages together on the the, the rigid wings for the, the the kites. Yeah, that that's been very helpful as well. Well, that was my next direction with these three D printers that they're now trying to do body parts with them. They are building neighborhoods out of 3D modules, homes. So- I, I don't yet need a body part, but there is a chocolate <laughs> one, I think. There's a, there's a 3D printer that will do cake. Oh, that's different. <laughs> that, so, that's more my scene. <laughs> in terms of fabricating the actual kite, the kite of it, what is that made of? Is it paper? Is it cloth? Is it- synthetic what what is it so i started with off the shelf ones um so just kite aerial photography kites up at the top and ram air little parafoil kites like two line toy kites going round and round but that's moved on now so we went to foam wings for the the rotary ones they're slightly more rigid you can get much cleaner airfoil um cords on those you can get those structures to, to be really efficient and lightweight and they yeah they'll be the, the tips of those are traveling sort of 200 miles an hour as they're going round and so they're <laughs> yeah yeah the, the, the wind is brutal did i mention <laughs> the, yeah that they're very fast what have been the biggest obstacles in developing kite turbines and how have you tackled them Ah, uh, probably remoteness, and they haven't really tackled that. That actually has been a blessing as well as a as as an obstacle because I, I have space to go and test. Yeah, I, actually, the relocation to Shetland was very hard. Much as there is a great engineering resource here, I don't have my my network from airborne wind energy uh, groups here, so you know, like it's not very close to the the universities that I've collaborated with, you know, like Strathclyde or. Oxford or some of the yeah some of the continental ones distance has definitely been a bit of a bit of an obstacle yeah I can imagine can you share a success story that really stands out in this journey of doing these windswept kite turbines well this year we got onto the the TechX accelerator in Aberdeen actually 
that for me, just recognizing and, and getting involved with Shell Game Changer, that has been recognition from industry that, that has given us support. So that, that's been enabling for them to develop a business and now to develop automation into the systems as well. Yeah, re- really giving us a bit of a direction. So, And what is this business called again? Shell Game Changer, or there's the Net Zero Technology Centre, which is part of the Scottish government, uh, and um, it's got sponsors like Equinor, Adnoc, BP. So yeah, there's oil companies interested in you know changing what they're up to, at okay. least nominally. They're still developing giant oil fields and getting approval for them as just not too far away from here, actually. But uh, yeah, I've been getting some support from them as well. And yeah, and being able to grow the business. Um, is there military interest in what you're doing? I did approach. I think kites kind of give you away a wee bit where you are. You know, <laughs> I'm a wee bit nervous of that. <laughs> I was thinking more in terms of creating energy for bases in remote yeah, areas. Not, absolutely, not for warfare, but is it a cheaper way to power their bases or facilities? No, that's understood. Yeah, that's absolutely essential. There are airborne wind energy companies specifically working with military in America as well. Windlift, I think, a contract. Yeah. What real world impact have your kite turbines had so far? Mostly the joy, <laughs> the energy, the small scale that we've been operating at has not had a huge impact. It, it, it's allowed scouts to charge their phones and stuff when they've been away. But, you know, I've boiled kettles and such like that. The scale that we've been able to test at so far hasn't been massive. There's not been a big rollout yet. And I think that if we're going to make this as, as a product that's reliable, as a product that's able to look after itself, it's robust enough to be able to be left in a field on its own, year after year doing its thing yeah. um, it's going to have to be quite a bit bigger than it is at the moment in order to be able to be worthwhile in order to meet the expense of that automation and so there's a fair bit of research that we're still doing the early models sure anyone can go out and build those put them up in the sky test them and you know when the wind drops you look after it bring it down and that, and then repeat that themselves but that's a fair bit of work that i think most people don't really have time for so you know in terms of the real world application it's going to take that automation in or and the scale and that's what the kite turbines enable is scale you know that that's the we're using really lightweight systems we're using tensile networks that expand and you can build upon and so yeah, impact at the moment, mostly in imagination, unfortunately, still. <laughs> it sounds like you're working on prototypes for possibility. Yeah, and absolutely. That, yeah. that stage, that's a generative stage for all things possible. And then you go to test it <laughs> and it brings you to that next level. Yeah. I'm curious, Rod, do you, looking a little bit ahead, where you are now, do you see like a time span, like in five years, you are hoping to have that scalable or large scale kite turbine farms, if you will? Do you have an idea or sense of the time? Yeah, we were hoping we're looking at about three years before we can get a 20 kilowatt system out on a farm and tested uh, running uh, like, like for sale. So the first first ones will be in about three years, we're thinking. Okay. Uh, that's just recently extended. We we were looking at a, a closer horizon and we were very product focused for a while, but with the, the static systems, we've decided no, they're they're not reliable enough. That so static lift systems. We're gonna have to go to a much more active system, uh, the, the top kite, so that we can make that a really reliable uh, system in the field. So yeah, it's going to take a bit longer now. But then beyond that, there are various schemes we're looking at for you know, networks of networks and and offshore deployments and such. And this could all change depending on if we go to valley tide systems or if there if if we do get large investments, then yeah, we could certainly accelerate these timescales. Um, it is all about rapid deployment as well. You know, this is the sort of thing that is so lightweight. You don't need to build a foundation so you can drill an anchor into the ground this that makes it a much more rapid deployment 
you yeah. can you know, remove it, take it with you. So if we can get these you know, electrical devices in quickly and you know, you know, change everything over to electric, then the faster we do it, the better. And, and so hopefully we can yeah, really start scaling as well. The portability of this is very exciting because when you think about the existing static wind turbines, that massive base structure that it takes because you're not mm. just putting a stem no. that's static. That propeller is constantly causing motion on that stem. Yeah. So whatever yeah. they're putting in the ground has to be huge. Yeah. Yeah. Even that the blade itself is, is a giant cantilever. So you've got a compounded cantilever system yeah. there. It's this giant thing and, and it scales with cubic mass. Uh, so you know, as you double the height of the thing you've got eight times the the weight so they've become colossally heavy yeah yeah and then when you take them down i mean they're mm -hmm. massive structures so at some point when they're no longer usable that's a huge takedown yeah there's a lot of clean and that, that concrete never comes out of the ground unfortunately here what they do is they, they build it over peat so there's a giant carbon store, but this gets kind of ripped up. They build a road across it. Then you dig out a massive hole. For, you know, so it's just, it's devastating landscapes where you don't have to do that. If you can just maybe helicopter something in and drop in an anchor instead, um, let the earth's surface and the wind itself be the structural components that, you know, so if you spread the anchors out across the ground and you let the wind inflate the system, then you instantly have sort of like dome structures that can really operate on huge scales. And that's why I was highlighting the massiveness of the static turbines to really ponder the beauty of the speed by which you could have these kite turbines. They just seem more controllable without yeah, it's, it's, damaging the terrain. Yeah, it's very lightweight deployment, really light. So do you see... Maybe not in, in the immediate future, how kite turbines will change our whole approach to renewable energy. If we talk about renewable energy, we're talking about climate change. Yeah, I shouldn't think we'd change the whole approach. I think we need as many different approaches. There's going to be so many solutions. And even within kite turbines themselves, there are so many different ways we've considered that they could be built and, and rolled out. That you know could be a hundred different companies doing just this. So yeah, if they're all kind of turbines, that's great. And for the part I've played, I'll be very grateful already. Um, so yeah. Do you see yourself staying primarily in the UK? Do you envision this worldwide? Uh, everywhere's got some sky above it, so <laughs> I am happy to travel with it. Take it around the world. Oh, for sure. We're talking about land. Do you even envision something for ocean use? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I've had many jobs on the water. Uh, yeah, in fish farms and oil rigs, worked in little fishing boats and all sorts. So, yeah, the the structures you have for modern offshore, uh, the fish farming setups, or even mussel farming. Uh, you have these arrays of floats in the mussel farms that are very similar to the anchor patterns that we need. They could even be complementary systems. And because the ocean is approximately flat surface, you can have a deployment that oh, yeah, can get a little wavy depending where you are. Compared to the size of the motion that the kites are going through, it's actually uh, very limited. It's a really good surface to deploy from. The nets for aquaculture, the, the ring-shaped nets as well. If you're looking for a system to drive a ring around all day, like, like a generator, yeah. actually it can be quite complementary as well. And if it's it got that ability to weather a cock to face any direction like the wind's coming from, from a ring structure like that, then yeah, sure. Again, it's a potentially complementary architecture. I almost yeah. think it might be easier for boats to be kite turbine powered. Oh, for boat transportation, that's that's an awkward one. So boats as, as well need to be, want to be fast. And boats do get towed by kites already. So you've got sky sails initially started out, um, yeah, doing ship towing. It's a tricky regime to work in the way. I, I, it's the economics also it kind of slows down some of the shipping. Yeah, it's a, that's a hard problem that one i think so in a perfect world rod 
How do you see windswept moving forward? What would you like to see happen? You've mentioned things about getting financial resources. You have so many moving parts in what you're doing. What would you like to have happen in a perfect world? Oh, people to just take it over and tell me how to do it. I think that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, just someone tell me how to do it better. <laughs> I don't know. I think you're the driving force of this, Rod. I think you're the okay. guy that's going to be telling us how to do this. Uh, <laughs> if I get to play with the toys, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd be happy with that. Well, I have to say, you do remind me of a big kid on a plane. <laughs> if I could be yeah, I feel, I feel like that. <laughs> and you bring that kind of, like any artist in the studio, there is a joy. It's hard work and you curse a lot, but there's a joy <laughs> to it. And you said, I have kept a clean mouth on this interview. I know you right? have, and so have I. <laughs> but when you're passionate about your work, yeah, and, and you certainly are. But the, the thing I'm really delighting in is your your humor about this, in the sense that it strikes me that you've had to develop this humor in order to sustain all the changes, the things that don't work, putting things together. You seem to take it with a, a fair amount of wit and grace. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I've, I've crashed on TV before and stuff. You know, it's kind of, you're going to laugh at yourself. You know? it's kind of, yeah, you can't be too serious about yourself. It's it's a mission. It's absolutely a mission. Way bigger than me. It's going to outlast me, the concept. So, yeah, I just feel lucky to be doing it. Well, it's a marvelous concept. It's a very exciting concept. And it feels like a bit of a game changer when this really gets developed in terms of uh, having wind power that's easier and cheaper to use. I just think for consumers down the road, I'm not talking soon, but this could really be a significant source of renewable energy. And I'm thinking communities, farms, small industry, it just seems like this can lend itself to so many things. Thanks, Pat. I like that. I hope it goes like that. And I think it can. Yeah, it's more than technology. It's hope in action. That's what I like about this. Thank you. Is there anything we missed, anything you'd like to tell us that I didn't ask you about, Rod? I'm going to put you on the spot now. I think we've put the flashy light on top of the kite well and truly, you know, I think we're, <laughs> we're not going to miss it. Wait, that is a question. Do you put lights on them? It depends on on the array, but yeah, we will will have to depending on yeah. the, the sizes. But yeah, yeah, you can be quite careful about how you do that as well. You can there's various ways you can light them up from whether it's from the control pods, whether it's from the ground, whether it's on board. Typically, it'll be on board. Well, Rod, it has been wonderful talking with you today, and your technology is more than exciting. And thank you for sharing this vision of kite turbines. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for spreading the joy, Pat. That's great. Hey, listeners, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and tell your friends. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.